First of all, I get there and he spit in my eyes. Mm -hmm. Second of all, once he spit in my eyes, he's being facetious and asking me questions. Then after that, he asked me if I saw and it didn't work. What do you do when you received a real word from God that did not work? Come on now. Oh, I'm reminded of a man by the name of Moses. The Bible says that he came to God came to Moses. He said, Listen, I need you to go to Pharaoh and tell him to let my people go. And he says, Who who, who should I say sent me? He said, I am that I am. Now it looked like Moses was empowered to walk out the process. But what do you do when you get a word that just won't work? So on the other end, he, he didn't tell him this, but he said, I'm gonna harden Pharaoh's heart. And even though you're going to come with the word, he ain't going to obey. What do you do when you know you got a real word from God? But on the other side, the stage is being set. He said, I'm going to harden his heart and he ain't going to even let him go. Because what God was doing was setting them up for judgment. See, you didn't understand when you were going through certain things that God was setting your enemy up so that he could destroy them all at the same time. So, so God now was telling Moses, go tell Pharaoh to let my people go. But on the other side, he's hardening his heart. No, don't let him go. I'm going to send plagues. Then you're going to get so bad at the plagues, you're going to run after them with everything that you got. You're going to run after them with your chariots, your horses, but I need to get all of them together oh, yes. in the Red Sea so I can destroy them all at the same time. So, so now, what do you do? Lord, have mercy. When you know you've been called, but your calling ain't working on your life. What do you do when you know you've been, doing, you've been called to do purpose things in the kingdom? But the kingdom stuff ain't working in your life. That's the reason why your calling cannot move you. Your walk with God is what I got to direct you. Because as long as it's based on your calling, you'll be in and out with your relationship with God. I'm not talking about your relationship with kingdom and your relationship with church. You'll be in and out. You'll be upset with God on Monday and on Tuesday you're back cool with him because you felt like he paid a bill or something. But as long as it's being pulled by your call, it's always going to create a position for you. But, but Jesus has a way of manipulating a situation that's literally going to be life-changing and it's going to force you to be conformed. Oh, yes. See, we repeat the scripture all the time. Be not conformed to this word, but be, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. See, we, we, most of the time we don't do that on our own, so he'll create a situation oh, yes, that's going to cause our mind to have to be transformed. You're just depending on that relationship, but you're not depending on God. So what will happen is he has to challenge the very thing that you've been depending on so that he can prove his power to you. I, I'm, I'm getting to close with Mark in a minute, but I'm reminded of Jacob. The Bible says that when God was able ready to do something with him, that Jacob was left alone. And there wrestled with him an angel to the breaking of the day. And he actually knocked his thigh right. out of joint. The thigh represents the strongest part of the body. And the Bible says the thing that he had been dependent on all this time has not been realized. What do you do when the thing you've been dependent on is out of pocket? That's one of the indications that God is about to do something with you. So, so what he'll do is he'll, he'll unalign it. Oh, Jesus. So now you've got to live like this. You've been depending on just your intellect, so God will challenge your intellect somehow. You've been depending on just the fact that you, you knew good Christian terminology, so he's going to challenge that. Oh, come on, come on. You've been depending on your marriage, so he's going to challenge that. So go and see what I love about God is this. The Bible didn't say, Mother, that he ever fixed his limp. As a matter of fact, he changed his name from Jacob to Israel, but only after the encounter. There are people that's trying to change their name and get a title, but you don't want the account of But I came to encourage you that when you get a real touch from God, it's not that he's going to make it right at first. Because the Bible says this, that Jacob had a limp. And to this day, he still got a limp. 
So his limp was just an indication that he's been in the presence of God. See, the problem with a lot of us is we think that just because we're in the process and we see men walking as trees that God is done with us. But won't you lean on your statement and say you just one touch away? When you know you one touch away, you can't afford not to be in the presence of God at all. When, when you get sick and tired of being sick and tired, you say enough is enough. There's no more excuses because I'm just one touch away. So now, verse 25 says it like this. Now, come on now. After that he put his hands again upon his eyes. See, people will make you feel like that you out of the will of God because you need a touch again. They'll make you feel like it's no way in the world I'm saved because I need a touch again. Well, I came to let you know as your pastor that I need touch after touch after touch. To do. Lean on somebody and say, I need a continual touch. See, when you make it up in your mind that you need a continual touch, can't nobody keep you from entering the presence of God. When you make it up in your mind that you need a continual touch, you can be on the aisle, the fifth row, at Kroger with eggs in your hand, and God mess around and meet you where you are, and you done mess around and drop the whole dozen. Because you know what? I pay this little $2.06 because my touch means more to me than them those So the fresh touch is what will cause you now to be able to move into the things of God. Not the new word. Not another conference. But a fresh touch. See, see I, I need you to hear this. After that, he put his hands again. Somebody shout again. I don't know who you are in here, but I came to encourage your heart that the, the presence of God is swelling up in this house to touch you again. When you make it up in your mind that you want a fresh touch from God, no demon in hell can stop you. So, so the Bible says that he put his hands on him again. Upon his eyes. Now I want to deal with that because... He put his hands on the problem area. One of the ways for you to know that God's about to do something amazing with you is when he touched that area again. See, he didn't touch his shoulder teak when he had an eye problem. He didn't touch his feet when he had a back problem. He touched the very thing that was the challenge spot for him. Oh, yes. I don't know who this is for, but I need you to understand that when he touches it, it's not to agitate it. He's only touching it because he's about to do something big. So the Bible says, it upon his eyes and made him look up. I need you to understand that when God touches that thing again, the next thing he's going to require that you do is that you look up at him. Because I'm going to tell you, when you're walking around and you're seeing men walking as trees, it can take you down to your knees where you feel like giving up. It'll have you secluded and behind a rock where you don't want to talk to anybody anymore. But from that place, no man is going to be able to help you. The Holy Ghost will meet you right there and say, look up. And there's something in your mind that will be reminded that I will look to the hills from which come my help. My help coming from the Lord. But see, the problem with a lot of us is we don't really want to look up when we're down. We want to stay down and get a pity party. We don't really want to call people and say, I need encouraging getting up. I just want to talk to people about being down. So now I start to connect with folk. They make me feel good about being down. But I came to let you know that when you're down, it's only an opportunity for you to look up. And just because you're down does not mean you're not on the God side. Because there is a season where you will walk through the valley of the shadow of death. And don't let nobody tell you that just because you're in a valley that you're out of the will of God. Because in the valley, the Bible says he'll comfort you. That rod and that staff. Come on, somebody. Is there anybody here that in the middle of your valley, God is able 
time to drop his hand on you. And the reason I know it happened to some of y'all is you wanted to give up. Even this last week, you wanted to throw in the towel. Even this week, and you didn't even understand that God was sending you a fresh touch. Why'd you lean on your neighbor and say, neighbor, I need a fresh touch. So the Bible says that once he received the second touch on the problem area. Now I need you to understand this. Isn't it amazing how we think God ought to touch something else? But this is what happens when he gets ready to deliver you. Hello, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. He said, listen, I know you're complaining. And you thought I should have been there. But I need you to just take me and show me where you're laid. See, the problem with a lot of us is that very thing that we've been going through. We've tucked it. We've hidden it. But when God gets ready to deliver you, he'll walk up on your scene. He'll meet you in your living room. He'll meet you at your door. And he said, all I need you to do is roll the stone away. See, by rolling the stone away, you just expose yourself to what's really going on. See, the reason why some of us, we can't get delivered is because we keep the stone covering it up. So we dress it up and start talking a certain way. We dress it up behind a certain way. But the Bible says that the reason he said roll the stone away, he said, I know it's stinking by now. See, the problem with a lot of us is the reason why we're still bound is that same place is rotten and stinky. That same place is causing me to be mean. That same place is causing my marriage to be under attack. But he said, if you just roll the stone away, I'll do the rest. Why don't you lean on your neighbor and say, neighbor, roll your stone away. So once you roll the stone away, you know the rest of the story. The word spoke to Lazarus. Lazarus came up out of the tomb. But see, the problem with a lot of us is see, we want an external prophecy instead of an internal word. See, it wasn't just Jesus the body that walked up to Lazarus' tomb. But as John said, in the, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And verse number 14 said, the word became flesh and dwelt among men. So it wasn't Jesus that walked up to the tomb, but it was the word. I came to encourage you today that if you pull back the stone, if you roll it away, this word is designed to pull you up. This word is designed to bring you out. This word is designed to align you. So the Bible says, as we close the text, that after he touched him again upon his eyes and made him look up again, and he was restored. Now I need you to understand what restored means. Unlike John 9, that man was born blind, so he never understood sight. For this man, now you be with me, preacher, for this man to be restored, which means at one point he had his sight, and then he went through something that called him to throw in the towel. I don't know who you are, that you had an experience, you had an encounter, and somehow you don't have sight, but God to give you a fresh touch and say not only am I going to heal you but I'm going to restore you now as I get ready to close restoration it looks like this a Mustang in 1955 may be worth a hundred dollars a Mustang for 2019 may be worth thirty thousand however when you take the 955 Mustang and you start working on it, why don't you lean on your neighbor and say God's working on it? So what will happen is in that Mustang, they start to cut it out and start to do some upgrades. They'll take an engine out and put a 400 horsepower engine. They'll take the seating out and put brand new leather in it. They'll take the paint job off and put 
it sprinkles all over it. And because now it's been invested in, it's been categorized as an antique. As I get ready to go, I want you to know that God's been invested in you. Somebody thought you were worth a dollar, but they didn't see the investment. Somebody thought you were no good, but they didn't see the investment. Somebody thought you wouldn't make it, but they didn't see the investment. But the Bible says that he that has begun a good work in you shall perform it unto the day of Jesus Christ. And the Bible said that this man, after he touched his eyes again, he made him look up. Now I need everybody in here that's found yourself in a midnight hour and you realize that this is a fresh touch. Symbolically now, I need you to hold back your head and look up. Because when you look up, you're going to start seeing it a little bit different. When you look up, you'll start seeing your healing. When you look up, you'll start seeing your deliverance. When you look up, you'll start seeing your restoration. So now, the same Mustang that was only worth a dollar because it's an antique, now you can mess around and get six figures from it. So you got people at the dealership that's coming out with something new that's only worth 30000 but because you're an antique and God has upgraded you, God has invested in you, now you're worth a hundred grand. Why don't you lean on your neighbor and say, neighbor, you're an antique. You're worth something. Everything God said, it's got to happen. Everything God proclaimed, it's got to happen. Say it. Yeah. Everybody's standing up. 